Welcome to the 11 o'clock live stream of Emmanuel Baptist Church of Sacramento. Thank you for joining me this Lord's Day morning and this Easter Sunday morning. If you're tuning in to IBC for the very first time, I would like to give you a very warm welcome. We're so thankful uh, that you are joining with us this morning. We trust that God will bless you as you hear His Word. For all of you who are IBC members this morning, there are a few things by way of announcements that I just want to give you. I want to remind you again that with our continued postponement of our public gatherings, we need to strengthen our resolve and our perseverance in the Lord as we await His providence to be able to be back together. Be assured that your pastors continue to monitor the directives of the authorities and to evaluate the situation. We, like you, are longing to be back together. Until then, please pray for us as we continue to pray for you and continue to maintain your contact with your care group leaders. For any of our members who are suffering financial hardship right now, please make us aware of the situation as there is the possibility of benevolence that you could have from the congregation here. Please contact your care group leader in order to make us aware of the situation. If you have special prayer requests, then your pastors would delight to hear from you. You can contact us at elders at ibc.sac.org. Let me give you that again, elders at ibcsac.org. You can send us your prayer requests, and we'd love to hear from you so that we can be praying for you during these days. The online giving information was sent to you last week again. We want to just remind you of that as we continue through this peculiar season. We know that the Lord's work continues to go on, even though we are somewhat hindered in some regards. And then you'll forgive me for indulging myself a little bit this morning, but I want to just thank you all for your kind uh, wishes, best wishes to Elaine and I, as the Lord has been pleased to bless Lois and Kevin with baby Isaac Robert. I had greetings from New Zealand, India, Europe, all across the world. I don't think my Facebook has ever had quite so many uh, attentions uh, as we've had, and we bless God for that today. I am hoping to actually meet the little guy at last. That doesn't mean the sermon will be any shorter, however. With these announcements aside, let us take the Word of God and let's read together. As you're at home and I'm here, we have the opportunity to turn to the Holy Scriptures. And we're going to do that this morning by reading together 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And yes, I am going to read the whole chapter. So let us read together this wonderful and very important portion of Holy Scripture regarding our Lord and the resurrection from the dead. Let us hear the Word of God. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised." But if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. 
If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has, also, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us, seek and, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a, li a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it, is, but it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed." In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let us pray together. Seek the Lord's help as we come this morning to His holy word. Our Father in heaven, you are the great eternal God. You created human life, and you rule over human life, and you bring all human life to an end. You give us health. You also send us illness. And you command all that happens in our lives 
in every place. In your holiness and in your righteousness, you made us to trust you, to love you, and to serve you. Father, in our sinfulness, we rebelled and turned away from you and sought to live our own way. We rejoice this morning that in your grace, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to rescue us and to reconcile us to yourself. It is in His life and in His death and in His resurrection from the dead that we find the forgiveness of our sins, peace with you, and eternal life. As we come to your Word this morning, we come to it depending upon the power of the Holy Spirit. As we sit at home, as we listen, teach us the great truths of your salvation. We pray particularly today that you would grant us understanding with regards to your Son, the Lord Jesus, and the resurrection from the dead that is promised to us through Him. Give us insight. Give us faith. Give us encouragement. Give us hope today, Father. May we be better informed, better instructed in the truths of Your Word and the realities that are offered to us in Jesus Christ. May our faith be strengthened as we turn to Your Word now. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What did J.D. Anderson, Lee Strobel, William Ramsey, Josh McDowell, Frank Morrison, Gilbert West all have in common? They are men who, being deniers and doubters regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, set out to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the dead, but ended up being believers. Unlike Richard Dawkins, the well-known modern-day atheist, he declared this, the message of the resurrection is petty, trivial, and earthbound, and unworthy of the universe. Whereas these other men, they researched and contemplated the claims of the Word of God and the Christian church regarding the historical, the physical, the bodily resurrection from Jesus Christ, and they concluded that indeed it was true. What about you this morning on this Easter Sunday when even the unbelieving world thinks about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Do you truly believe in Jesus Christ risen from the dead? Do you understand why it matters? Do you understand what it means? Do you grasp the implications and the ramifications for the world and for the human race with regards to our Lord's resurrection from the dead? Ever since the days of the apostles, there have been deniers and doubters regarding Christ and His resurrection. There has also been a lack of understanding, it would seem, in certain quarters with regards to the importance and the meaning of resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this morning, on this Easter Sunday morning, I want to address with you this great topic of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And we can do no better, I believe, than to go to one of the most important passages in all of the Bible uh, regarding this subject. It's found here in 1 Corinthians 15, and we've read it together. It's a lengthy chapter. It is a very comprehensive chapter with regards to this topic. The Apostle Paul is writing to a first century church that has many issues. We know that they were divided over their celebrity preachers, their favorite preachers. They had issues with sexual immorality. They were struggling to deal with matters of Christian liberty. They were taking one another to court. And here in chapter 15, we also discover that they were debating and disagreeing over the resurrection from the dead. We see, don't we, that uh, the church is imperfect. The church is indeed marked by many spots and many blemishes, and yet the gospel of Christ is critically important to be taught to the church, to be understood by the church, that the church then might be faithful to the Lord Himself. And in the time that we have this morning, I want to set before you six truths from Paul's treatment of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead 
that I'm persuaded we need to understand and believe. Six truths that are foundational to understanding the significance and the importance and the meaning of Christ's resurrection from the dead. They're designed, I believe, in this passage written by the Apostle Paul to encourage us and to help us as Christians to persevere in our faith and to handle those who are deniers and doubters. So, as we walk into this passage together, let us consider, first of all, the truth that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is central to the Christian gospel. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is central to the Christian, Christian gospel. We see this in verses 1 through 11. Here, as the Apostle Paul opens up into this chapter, remember, of course, the chapter headings are uh, put in later. They're not there in the original. But as he moves into this section of his letter, the Apostle Paul now begins uh, to speak to the church regarding the gospel itself. And he makes it clear here in his treatment of the gospel, or in his explanation, as it were, of the gospel, that the the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ has two key foundational elements to it that are non-negotiable. At the heart of the Christian gospel, two great truths are declared to us. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures— and the promises of God, and that Jesus Christ, having died for our sins, rose from the dead according to the Scriptures and according to the promises of God. And so, what we see here, as the Apostle Paul lays this out for us, is that without the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, there is no gospel. The good news about Jesus Christ has two components that must be kept together. You notice how Paul puts it in verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance, of the, as of the most significant truths that you need to grasp, uh, that I also received, that Christ died for our sins according with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. That's why when we think of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must always think of His life, His death, and His resurrection Uh, together. They all play uh, different roles in our redemption, but the reality is that they must be kept together. Jesus, having lived a sinless life, having died a sacrificial death, that same Jesus rose from the dead. And as a result of His sinless life, Jesus in His death took the penalty that we deserved satisfying the Father's justice, turning away the Father's wrath for all who trust in Him. In His resurrection, He was vindicated by the Father. He ascended to glory in order to secure the application of what He accomplished in His death. And as I believe Pastor Steve will deal with tonight, uh, the sending of the Spirit and entering into a high priestly intercession at the Father's right hand is also an inseparable part of Christ's work for us. In verses 5 through 8 of this opening section, we hear from Paul that there were a number of witnesses historically to the resurrection. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then what are we to make of these testimonies? Were these people hallucinating? Were they lying? Why, as we shall consider later, would they be willing to risk their whole lives on something that was merely a hallucination or a lie? These are questions we must ask as we wrestle with the historicity and the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Their conviction that Jesus Christ has risen was such that it changed their whole lives. They were willing to forsake everything for Christ as a result of their belief that he who had died had also risen from the dead. They became consumed with bringing this message of glorious hope to the world. They were persuaded that there is is one who has come from God, who has lived a, a, a perfect life, died a sacrificial death, and risen from the dead, whose name is Jesus Christ, and they wanted to tell the world about him. You see, whoever believes in Christ, the gospel tells us, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so, Paul's first point in his treatment of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead is to set out before us that the resurrection of Christ 
has a place at the very heart of the Christian gospel. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is central to the message of the Christian gospel. If we do not believe in Jesus Christ risen from the dead, then we do not believe the gospel, and we cannot therefore be saved from our sins. Secondly, notice this truth. If there is no resurrection, there is no salvation from sin. Paul begins to develop this in verses 12 through 19. 12 through 19. Notice what Paul says. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul had been in correspondence with this church in Corinth. Uh, his letters, in many ways, are responses to questions that were asked, to uh, hearing about the disputes that they were facing. Here we see very obviously uh, that there were those in the church, yes, those in the church who were questioning the reality of a resurrection from the dead. We need to understand that uh, the denial of resurrection from the dead is not just a 19th century uh, phenomenon. It's been an issue down through the centuries. Even in the first, first century church, there were those who rejected the idea that there could be any resurrection from the dead. And the apostle Paul, he wants to address that very clearly here. But if there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. Paul has laid the foundation of the fact that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is central to the gospel message. And as he has done that, he now moves on then to address the specific issues that he's heard are plaguing the church in Corinth. Like every church, Corinth evidently had some who would rise up and would deny the truth of the Word of God. Now, how big this group was, we cannot tell, but it's obviously big enough for Paul to want to take it on clearly. Paul lays out several key issues here that add up to the main thrust of this section uh, with regards to his treatment of our subject. He, he first of all makes it very clear that a denial of a bodily resurrection of any kind means you must therefore logically de deny Christ himself has risen from the dead. We see that in verse 13. Then he goes on in verse 14 to speak of the fact that a denial of Christ's resurrection, as you would understand, means that preaching that he is risen is a futile pursuit. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Why would we preach Jesus is risen if he has not risen? What would be the point of doing that? He then goes on to also speak in verse uh, 14 uh, of a denial of Christ's resurrection, meaning uh, that believing in Christ being risen is a futile thing. If we say that Christ uh, is risen and that we believe that He is risen, but He is not risen, then our faith is in vain. The Apostle Paul is laying out why it's so important to understand that uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is central to our Christian lives to the Christian faith. He then makes it clear in verse 15 that if Christ is not risen, then the apostles themselves are liars. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. So, when we deny the resurrection of, Je uh, the, resurrection of the body, period, we deny the resurrection of Jesus, we then make out that the apostles really were telling lies and misrepresenting God. These are not small issues when it comes to the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 17, it makes it clear that if our faith in a risen Christ is futile, then, our, then we are not forgiven for our sins and we are without salvation. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. We are not right with God, we are not saved, we are still lost. And those who have already died in the Lord, verse 18, they are lost if there is no resurrection from the dead. It means every grave that we ever stand at and every grave that we ever weep at is the end and there is nothing in the future. If there is no resurrection of Christ from the dead, then Christians are to be pitied for believing in something that is not true. And that is an obvious deduction, isn't it? It's vital in this day in which we live 
In this age of materialism and uh, science that mocks the de- and denies the possibility of bodily resurrection, and so therefore by implication denies the resurrection of Christ uh, and therefore the gospel, that we understand what the implications are of such denials. They are many. They are varied, as Paul lays out here. If there is no bodily resurrection from the dead, then Christ did not rise. And if Christ did not rise, then there is no gospel, and there is no salvation from sin. And we who profess that there is, we of all people on the earth are are pitiable and deceived. You cannot be a Christian without believing in the resurrection from the dead. Without resurrection from the dead, our Lord has not risen. To believe in a resurrection from the dead and in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we must understand it's not a scientific question. No amount of conditions scientifically can be reproduced to satisfy this question scientifically. I don't believe you could even argue that it's a philosophical question in many regards. No amount of mere reasoning and logic can answer the issue, did Jesus rise from the dead? Is there a resurrection from the dead? Now, I believe that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is a historical, cosmological, and theological question. It's historical and cosmological in this sense that it actually happened in time and space. There was an empty tomb. There was a risen person, seen and encountered by many ushering in a new time in cosmic history, if you will, as a result. And it is only explicable theologically as God reveals it to us in His Word. Theological in that God, through Christ, rising from the dead, has accomplished redemption and ushers in a new era in the universe, a new era of a new humanity that has been inaugurated in the establishing of the kingdom of God, and that, as we'll see later, will be consummated at the return of this risen, ascended, reigning Christ. And so, we must be very clear this morning that if there is no resurrection, there is no salvation from sin. That brings us to our third consideration, our third truth that we want to draw out from this passage. The resurrection of Jesus Christ marks the securing of a new humanity. The resurrection of Jesus Christ marks the securing of a new humanity. Verses 20 through 28. When I first read the quote from Richard Dawkins that the message of the resurrection is petty, trivial, and earthbound, and unworthy of the universe, I I must confess I found myself asking the question that I often ask when I read Dawkins, does this man ever actually read the Bible? Does he ever read it and consider actually what it's teaching? Here in Paul's treatment of Jesus and resurrection from the dead, the apostle could not make it clearer Uh, with regards to this whole matter of the significance of the resurrection for the universe. And contrary to Dawkins' message regarding the message of the resurrection, we see here it is far from petty, trivial, and earthbound. It is, in fact, of cosmic importance. In verses 20 through 28, Paul pulls the camera back for us to contemplate the cosmic and eschatological importance of our Lord's resurrection from the dead. He speaks clearly of God's purpose in Jesus Christ to create a new humanity out of the old humanity. Notice how Paul sets it out for us. He speaks of Adam and the death that comes through him. And then he speaks of Christ and the resurrection from the dead that comes through him. We see that in verse 21. For as by man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Who are these men? For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Here is the important theological, biblical truth of federal headship set out for us by the apostle. 
The human race exists as a result of God creating Adam, our first parent, and from him we all descend, and from him we all receive his guilt, and we all receive his corrupt nature. Due to his disobedience, we all come under uh, the, uh, the wrath of God, the judgment of God. If we continue to go through this world only in Adam and never coming into Christ, we will face God without his pardon, without his righteousness, and we will perish. If, however, we come to believe in Christ and enter into union with him, we enter into the new humanity by grace through faith, and we shall receive all the benefits that God intends that Christ has secured in his life, death, and resurrection. We shall be made alive with him for all eternity. And so Paul makes it clear that the resurrection of Christ from the dead is the beginning of a new humanity and marks the beginning of God's end time in human history. The inauguration of God's kingdom mediated by Jesus Christ and destined to bring all of God's enemies to heal, finally destroying death itself. That's what Paul lays out in verses 23 through 28. Paul gives us a big picture perspective here with very broad strokes. Christ having risen, he is reigning, and he is saving and defeating his enemies. He will return and consummate all things and hand over all to the Father to finally and completely establish God's authority in every corner of the universe as God intends. A complete reversal, more gloriously reversing the whole issue of the fall and all that has happened. Richard Dawkins could not be more wrong with regards to his understanding of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus and the resurrection from the dead is glorious and vital and cosmic in its significance and in its meaning. God in Christ is rescuing and redeeming His whole created order. And all who repent of their sins and believe in His Son they shall have part in this great and wonderful plan. That brings us to our fourth consideration. Our fourth consideration. If there is no resurrection, certain pursuits have no point. If there's no resurrection, certain pursuits have no point. Verses 29 through 34 address this. As he continues his train of thought, the apostle wants to address really three practical points for the Corinthians as he exposes the contradiction of thinking Christ is risen but denying the reality of bodily resurrection. The first one is the strange and difficult issue of baptism from the dead, verse 29. One of the most peculiar and difficult texts, I think, in the New Testament is this one about baptism from the dead. Many notions have been put forward for this practice. Mormons have embraced it as an orthodox thing to do, uh, notwithstanding their unorthodox even understanding of Jesus. Whatever Paul is referring to, and I believe it's likely something the Corinthians did due to either the premature deaths of some in the ranks or a belief that baptism by proxy in some way benefited those who died in Christ, uh, Paul makes it clear that even this practice has no point if there is no resurrection from the dead. He also addresses the matter of suffering for the gospel in verses 30 through 32. Paul makes it very clear that if we believe in resurrection from the dead, if we don't believe in resurrection from the dead, then what's the point of suffering for resurrection from the dead? Why are we in danger? He says, every hour I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain? If humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. He speaks of being in danger for the sake of the gospel, fighting with beasts in Ephesus. I think a metaphor for his battles for the gospel in Ephesus. Also, the possibilities, of course, of dying in the arena. But Paul makes it clear, if there is no resurrection from the dead for the believer, then we might as well just eat and drink and be merry because we die and that's the end of it all. Suffering for the truth of the gospel is a futile exercise if there is no resurrection from the dead. And thirdly, in verses 33 through 34, he makes it clear that there is really no point in the pursuit of a holy life. No point in the pursuit of a holy life. You see, pursuing a holy life is worthwhile. Why? Because there is life yet to come. 
And if there is no resurrection from the dead, there is no life to come, then what is the point then of striving to be holy? What point is there to die daily to self and to seek to live faithfully before God if in the end there is nothing beyond the grave? Denying resurrection from the dead and so denying Christ's resurrection and the gospel, it has very practical implications in our daily lives. And Paul is concerned here as he writes to this church that we're, we're loose in their morals at times, we're, we're, we're licentious at times. He says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. I think he's directly addressing those who are professing to be believers, who are denying the doctrine of resurrection, and he's making it very clear to them they need to repent of their false doctrine, and they need to put their lives in order before the Lord. He's even concerned as to whether some of them even know the Lord at all. And so, if there is no resurrection from the dead, Paul wants us to understand that certain pursuits have absolutely no point in our lives. Brings us to our fifth consideration. The resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees the resurrection of all who trust in Him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees the resurrection of all who trust in Him. We find this in the lengthier section of verses 35 through 48. Having addressed the contradiction of those who confess belief in Christ's resurrection but deny the reality of bodily resurrection in general, Paul now turns to a second aspect of this controversy. He turns to those who are not outrightly denying, as it were, the resurrection, I believe, but were questioning, well, how, how is it going to work? How, is it, how can it come about? How can it actually happen? If there is a resurrection from the dead, what is it like? Verse 35, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? We realize, don't we, that we're not the first people to speculate about things beyond us. We're not the first people to ask questions about how it's all going to come to pass. The first century Christians were doing the same. Those who were denying and doubting a bodily resurrection are doing so in part because they cannot conceive of the body that they possess being resurrected. Others are wondering, well, if it's true, what is it going to be like? And Paul addresses this by, first of all, an analogy, and then by way of a contrast. Three analogies he uses, first of all, speak of the manner in which bodily resurrection shall occur. occur. Notice the analogy from agriculture, the analogy from the natural world, and the analogy from astronomy that the Apostle Paul employs. Verse 37, he employs the analogy from agriculture. What You sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. He's pointing them to something they would be familiar with, sowing seed to die and reaping a harvest. Then in verse 39, he goes on and he says, For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies, earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. Even in the natural world, we see, don't we, that there are all different kinds of bodies and all different kinds of flesh in the animal world. And even in astronomy, in verse 40, he makes it clear that even uh, in astronomy, there are different uh, heavenly bodies, earthly bodies, glory of the sun different from the glory of the moon. So, Paul draws out these three analogies to help us to see, look, if you look around at the natural world, as you look around at the world that you're living in, you can see the reality of different bodies having different aspects to them. And therefore, he's going to draw it together. He's going to make it clear. Therefore, it's not a stretch, is it, to believe that the body that we have now, though it dies, can be resurrected in a different way, with a different different makeup, as it were, for all eternity. And this is what he speaks to, I think, by way of contrast, by way of contrast in verses 42 to 48. Notice this lengthy section that he addresses this issue with. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable is raised imperishable. In other words, that which decays will give way to that which never decays. 
Sown in dishonor, it raised in honor. That which is declining physical appearance, it has declining physical appearance, gives way to that which will have no physical declining physical appearance. That's a great encouragement as we get older, isn't it? <laughs> Sown in weakness, raised in power. That which dies and goes into the ground gives way to that which is risen from the grave. Verse 43. So in a natural body, raise the spiritual body. That which is of this earthly realm gives way to that which is of the future spiritual realm. Verse 44. And then he says, sown in union with Adam, raised in union with Christ. That which is connected to our first, the first parent, Adam, will give way to that which is connected to our head, Christ. Verse 45. And then perhaps the most wonderful conclusion to this uh, section comes out in verses 46 through 48, where he makes it clear that so, as, as, as we sow the image of the man of dust, so we are raised to bear the image of the man of heaven. That which is united to Adam in death will be raised to life through union with Christ to be made like him. He's bringing us to our glorification. And so he's facing down the deniers and the doubters. Paul makes it clear in this section of his treatment of our subject that the bodily resurrection of the believer is guaranteed in Christ because God has ordained it to be that way. Verse 49. He uses uh, the threefold analogy and then he uses this uh, several part uh, contrast to help us understand the reasonableness of resurrection from the dead. What is Paul's argument? I think it's this. By looking at the natural world and how it works with seed dying and harvest rising, considering the different kinds of flesh possessed by different creatures in different environments, knowing that different entities possess different kinds of glory, it's perfectly reasonable to believe that God in bodily resurrection can do the very same thing that we would understand what God's purpose is in us dying and rising from the dead. The body that is buried is connected to the body that rises, but it is very different. The body that is to come will be equipped in its essence for the environment that it is to inhabit. And because Christ himself has, has risen to inhabit that realm, all who are united to him by faith will also inhabit a body like his. Now, that is a glorious encouragement and a blessed hope for us as those who are heading down toward the grave. I wonder, are you a denier of bodily resurrection? Do you doubt it can happen? Then you're not considering even the world around you in which you live, where God has given you a foreshadowing of all that he is able to do, even as he has set up the natural world in which we live. If God in Christ has united you to his Son, whom he sent to live for you and die for you and rise from the dead for you, then just as he has equipped Christ to inhabit eternal glory, he will also equip you to inhabit eternal glory at the end of the age. And this, dear Christian, is our blessed hope in the Lord. It is to this end, to the end of the age, that Paul now draws our attention as he concludes his treatment of this great and glorious subject of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And so we come to our sixth and final consideration. In Christ, God's purpose to destroy death and bring about eternal salvation is fulfilled. In Christ, God's purpose to destroy death and bring about eternal salvation is fulfilled. We find this in verses 50 to the end of the chapter. As I've already mentioned, when Christ came into the world, He inaugurated or established a new age. It is the beginning of the age to come, the new creation. It's prophesied by the prophets. It's expected by the prophets. It was the culmination of all of God's promises to Israel. Described in various parts of the New Testament as the kingdom of God, Christ as king has established the kingdom of God at his first coming. And he will consummate it, bring it into fullness at his second coming. Paul speaks to the fulfillment of God's purpose in Christ in this final section. He tells us our bodies must be changed to inhabit eternal glory. We see that in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, 
Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. He's not saying that we will not enter into eternal glory as human beings. He's simply saying there has to be change in our humanity so that we might inhabit eternity. Secondly, we see some believers will die and be resurrected. Some will be alive and changed at Christ's coming. Verses 50 to 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Paul then tells us, for this, in, in a, for this perishable body, verse 53, must, be, must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the sayings, what? Of the prophets, the fulfillment of the prophets. When this final day of resurrection comes, and we are equipped for all eternity to dwell for all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth, the prophet Isaiah's words in Isaiah 25, 8 will be fulfilled. Death will be swallowed up in victory. When that day comes, then the words of the prophet Hosea will be fulfilled. Hosea 13, 14, death's sting will be gone because it will be banished from the universe. In this consummation, God will not only destroy the enemy, which is death, but also the enemy, which is sin. And even the very role of the law of God will actually change. Brothers and sisters, there is no message like the Christian message. There is no hope like the blessed hope of the Christian gospel. The Christian message declares that Christ died for our sins and that He rose from the dead. His resurrection from the dead means that there is a resurrection from the dead for mankind yet to come. One that in Christ we must look forward to and be confident in when the day of resurrection comes for the believer and we take possession of our resurrection bodies as believers, death will be gone. Sin will be gone. Even the role of the law in our lives will change. We will be delivered into the eternal kingdom of God, the new heavens and the new earth. And so having laid out his argument for believing in Jesus and the resurrection from the dead, the apostle closes his discourse with an all-encompassing word of application. What should our response be to the truth of Jesus and resurrection from the dead? Paul gives it to us in one of the most wonderful verses in the New Testament to the Christian. Therefore, my beloved brothers, in the light of all that I've said regarding the gospel and Christ and the resurrection from the dead, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We're to be steadfast, marked by a sound commitment of heart to God and Christ. Immovable, that is, we're to be marked by an unshakable resolve regarding God and His purpose in His Son. We are to be always abounding, that is, marked by a continuous engagement with the world regarding this great gospel of Christ, that men need to believe it in order to be saved. We're to be involved in these things because this is the work of the Lord the great message of hope in Jesus Christ. And Paul makes it very clear, doesn't he, that we do this because we know that in the Lord, because of this truth that is in Christ, our labor is not in vain in Him. We are on the right side of history when we are in Christ because everything is going toward that ultimate day when there shall be a resurrection from the dead. Sorry, Richard Dawkins, the message of the resurrection is not petty, it's not trivial, it's not earthbound, it's not unworthy of the universe. It is, in fact, the greatest message ever given, ever heard. It is the most important message ever from God. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried and He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. This message is not worthy of the world because the world is sinful and hostile towards God, but it is the message that God has brought to us in His Son because of His love and because of His grace and because of His mercy. 
And so this unusually and restricted Easter season of 2020 should cause us to ponder and think upon our lives, upon our end, upon our need of Jesus Christ, who has died for our sins and risen from the dead. May it be this morning that we would find peace with God and hope for eternity in the one who has risen from the dead. Amen. Let us turn to the Lord and let us close in prayer. Father, what wonders are contained in your holy word. You teach us truths that we would never know nor understand unless you revealed them to us in the Scriptures. And in these days of trouble and trial, in the face of death because of disease, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the great hope that lies at its center, that though we may die, yet shall we live through faith in your Son. We thank you that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose on the third day according to the Scriptures. We thank you that because of Christ, sins can be forgiven. Because of Christ, preaching the gospel makes sense. Because of Christ, we have hope not only for this life, but the life to come. You've created the world in such a way as to put on display your power and your purpose. You're working out your purposes, even in these challenging times. Father, we pray this morning that in the midst of a society that is confused and fearful, that you will grant those of us who are in Christ grace to bear testimony to the truth of the gospel, to bear testimony to the hope that we have in Jesus regarding resurrection from the dead. Again, we would pray for our president and all his advisors that grace would be given to him and all who are making decisions at the federal level. We would pray also for our governor and all his advisors here in California, that they too would have wisdom in making decisions that affect all of our lives. We would ask you that you would sustain all who are continuing to work in the medical realm. We pray for all who are afflicted with this COVID virus, that you would show mercy and grace, and that those, Lord, who are leaving this world because of this virus, that you would bring your gospel of hope to them before it's too late. We also pray for those who are concerned about their livelihoods, some already realizing that they will not easily recover financially. Father, give them grace and show them mercy and grant them wisdom. May they understand that our lives do not consist merely of the things that we possess and that we need to be believing in Jesus Christ to be right with God, to have eternal life. Father, as a church, we confess we are weary of not meeting. We lament our separation. We desire to be gathered to sing your word together, to read your word together, to pray your word together, to hear your word preached together. We long to observe the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper together, that we might again enjoy the sweetness and the blessedness of communion. O oh Lord, hear our plea. We ask that you would be pleased that soon you would lift restrictions and enable us to be back together. We're thankful for modern technology, for conference calls, even for this live stream for texts and for phone calls, but we recognize it is not the same as actually meeting together. And so we pray, Lord, that soon we would enjoy fellowship together again. May your word in the meantime strengthen us. May we live in the light of our resurrection from the dead through Jesus Christ. And may you be pleased, Father, to grant us the persevering grace that we need until you're pleased to bring us together again. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.